So I'm going to talk about Dr. Valentine and people kind of ask me, why did you do this? Well, it all started because I was working on a fractional exhibit and um, I needed information. So we'll talk a bit about why I did all this research. We're going to explore Dr. Valentine's family life and his early years. Uh, most people know him as his involvement with the uh, New York Numismatic Club. He was uh, an early member there and his publications. And we'll talk about his two major publications. And then we're going to explore what happened to the family. Now this plays into why I've done all this. And researching you have to become a genealogy detective. So we'll talk about that a little bit. In search of a picture, I wanted a picture of Dr. Valentine for my exhibit. So I started making contacts and stuff. Very hard to find. We found this one. This was the new, first New York Numismatic Club dinner, their annual dinner. This was in 1913. Uh, anybody pick out anybody in this picture you might know who they are? I do have a complete list, but I didn't bring it. It's like, uh, that's Albert Fry. Okay. Kind of know who he is. It's Henry Chapman. Okay. This young man here is 26 year old. Do you know who that is? He's 26 in this picture. That's Fred Boyd. Dr. Valentine's in this picture. He's right there. Right in the back. Not a real good picture for an exhibit. He's sitting there with his wife, Ada. So, okay, let's keep looking. I'm still trying to find another picture. Ah, another dinner. Seems that dinners were a good excuse to take pictures. This was the ANS NYL, NYNC dinner in 1917. Dr. Valentine is in this picture. He's the only one not facing the camera. He's right there, tucked back in that corner. No picture. Everybody I talked to, nobody could find a picture. Talk to Steve Crane. Now, Stephen Crane is uh, a very uh, well-known person as it relates to half dimes. That's his area of expertise. He didn't have any picture. So the search begins. The thought was if I could trace the family I might find a photo album that some descendant might have and there may be a picture. So that's how he started doing this detective work. Started out that his dad was Charles Valentine, his mother was Sarah, and they married in 1860. God, I could find a nice picture of his dad, but not of him yet. His older brother was Charles Fleetwood Valentine. He was born in 61, and Daniel was born in 63. And they lived in New York City. In 67, when Daniel was four years old, they moved across the Hudson to a new community that was just under development called Englewood, New Jersey. Charles opened a real estate office there and also a local hardware store. There's an advertisement that came out of a local paper at the time, although we've changed the writing so you could read it because it was pretty poor. But that was an advertisement for his hardware store in 1860s in Englewood. Daniel worked in his dad's hardware store when he got to be a little older. This was a period that was shortly after the Civil War. So the, there were tokens and stuff around and they were worthless. So you had to learn quick about what was a real value coin and what was a token. Otherwise, he would get reprimanded when the tokens ended up in the cash box. Fractional currency was still around, but it was quickly disappearing because the U.S. had started, the mint had started making silver coin again. 
So this is about the time that he started kind of getting interested in fractional. As near as we can tell, records are obviously pretty scarce. Daniel's early years. As a youth, he attended both public and private schools. This is a picture of what was at the time, back in Daniel's time, a private school. At this point, it was a, it was a home. This is after the turn of the century. There's the first public school that was in Englewood, where Daniel also attended. The family was active members of the Presbyterian Church there in Englewood, New Jersey, and that's the uh, church as it existed in 1860. That's when it was established. Daniel also played on a local baseball club. Abner Dumbleday had invented this game in Chicago a few decades earlier, and it was sweeping the nation. So there were a lot of local clubs that got put up, and Daniel's on this, this club called the Pioneer. And they played against another local rival group called the Inglewoods. Can anybody pick out Daniel? He's in there. Daniel, not yet, has the mustache. There he is. He does not yet have his mustache. Okay? Another picture of Daniel. A little early for what I was trying to do. Dental school. So Daniel attended the New York College of Dentistry. Whoops. What happened? Oh, there it goes. Sorry. He graduated with a degree in dentistry in 1887, and this is the program from that graduation. And you can see his name here listed as a, as a student presented for graduation. After graduation, like a lot of folks during that time that graduated out of a medical school, they went and spent time in Europe. And he went and spent a little over a year in Vienna, expanding his knowledge and stuff of dentistry. Then late, approximately late in 88, I think it is, he moved back to the U.S. and opened up his, his first practice in New York City. In 96, he moved that practice across the Hudson over to Inglewood, where his family was. Now, let's explore a little bit of his future wife. Adabel Colwell was her name. She was born in 1863, and she was the third child of Benjamin and Sally Orr of Cowders Point, PA, in Portville, New, Jersey, or New York. Benjamin was in the lumber business. He sold lumber. His whole family was in it. He traveled around that area quite a bit, um, and they lived in a couple different places. I found this picture of Adabel in some family, Caldwell family material. And this is Adabel as a young girl. Notice the ringlets in her hair and stuff. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? She attended public schools and then went to the Elmira Female College, okay? Because a lot of the colleges there tend, tend to be gender specific. And she graduated with honors as a teacher. So she was a teacher. And she graduated in the last part of June of 1884. And in 85, she began her teaching job in Orlean, Orlean New York. Her father was in the lumber business, as was his brother, and they moved to Harrisville, Michigan, to join his other family members, because they had a big lumber business there. Okay? If you recall your history, shortly before this, about 10, 12 years earlier, there was a small fire in Chicago, and they needed lumber to rebuild. So the Colwells were quite pleased about that to some degree because they were selling a lot of lumber down to Chicago. Bell had moved from 
Orlean, New York, as near as we can tell, to Inglewood because this lady, Catherine Jones, was a good friend of hers from college and she lived in Inglewood. That's where we surmise that she met Daniel because Daniel's family was still there, or was there, yes. Annabelle taught in Inglewood for one year and then she became very, very ill. So she had to return to her family because of this illness. Then the next record we found about her was back in 1894. She was now a second grade school teacher at Alcona County Schools in, Harrisburg, Michi in Harrisville, Michigan. We have to surmise that they were communicating because we don't find any records or any newspaper articles of travel back and forth. Although we do find a few of Adabel traveling to visit her friend Kathleen Jones in Englewood. But nothing going, nothing of Daniel traveling to Michigan until there's an article in, in mid-October of Daniel and his best man, Harry McBee, traveling to Englewood from Englewood to Harrisville, Michigan. And then on October 28th, they were married at the Harrisville Presbyterian Church. And there's records of that, because if you can see, right down here, October 28th, 96, Daniel Webster Valentine, Ada Bell Caldwell. He was a dentist out of New York, Inglewood, New York. Dad was C.W. Valentine, Sarah Fleetwood, and Benjamin Caldwell, and Sally Orwell. So they got married there. The reception was held at the Caldwell Mansion, which was where George Caldwell, which was the older brother, the one that owned the business, lived. It still stands today. The Caldwell family owned it until, eight, into, until the 1950s. It had been converted into a bed and breakfast called the Widow's Watch. Does everybody, anybody knows what a widow's watch is? A widow's watch is a little room on top of a house where the female of the house would go and watch for their husband to return from sea. You see that out in the, in the New England area more so. But this house was about two blocks off of Lake Huron. The family had a dock there, a railroad, and the mill was just down the road. So. Mr. Caldwell would go up in the widow's walk and he could oversee his empire, basically. They also had 6,000 acres of virgin timber to the west that they harvested, milled, sent down to Saginaw, and then trained across to Chicago. In talking with the proprietor of that at one point a number of years ago, she talked about this bay window. And in that bay window she explained that there is a seat that comes up and a lot of old houses will have bay windows, have a fold up seat in the compartment and they put stuff underneath it. And she said under the seat of that bay window is Ada Caldwell's name. She carved it there. It's still there. Following the wedding, Daniel and his bride moved back to Ingle, Inglewood where they lived for the next 35 years. Now let's talk about their family. Daughter Mary and Kathleen, Catherine was born in 1887. They had a second daughter, Margaret, born in 1899. And in early 1907, Margaret became quite ill. Bad timing. There were already 30 cases of scarlet fever that year in Englewood, New Jersey. So what do you think happened? Their house and their home, and they were all quarantined. Now, the health department had never visited the daughter. It was all on hearsay. But she had never been examined by the health department. Nonetheless, it didn't stop them from the scare of scarlet fever to quarantine them. 
Dr. Valentin brought in four f independent physicians to do exams and they all said independently it was not scarlet fever. Health department, nope, you're quarantined, did nothing about it. So he sued him, trying to protect his family. So he sued him and it went all the way to the New Jersey Supreme Court. Of course, by the time it got to that point, it became a principal because Margaret had gotten better. But he lost. And it's interesting to read the briefs. It's a, quite an interesting perspective they went through. But he was protecting his family. He was involved in a lot of different things besides currency. He was involved, he was a mason. He was an elk. Okay? He belonged to the first district dental society of New York, the New Jersey State Dental Society, and the National Dental Association. He was also on the board of directors of a railroad in the area. I, that one I don't understand, but... Okay, let's talk about his numismatic life a little bit. He joined New York Numismatic Club in 1910. And he remained an active member until 1932. He joined ANA in 1912. He was appointed the chair of the New York Numismatic Club's Paper Money and Publications Committee in 1913. And he was elected as a president for the New York Numismatic Club in 1918 and again in 1920. He had served, he served other roles, but he had served as president two separate years. And with tradition of the New York Numismatic Club, they issued a medal in his honor. The medal was designed by J.M. Swanson. This was the last one that was issued with this reverse. After this one was issued, they changed the reverse of their medals. They issued eight silver and 50 bronzes. This medal is somewhat, I talked to folks that are collectors of the NYNC medals and they say this is one of the key medals for the group. Why is it key? The census that we've run for about four or five years, we can only account for two silver and 12 bronzes. So we always ask folks, if you happen to have one and would like to tell us the number of the one you have, we'll just add it to our census so we can just find out how many still exist. But that's kind of why it's the key. <laughs> Anybody trying to get a complete set, this is the difficult one to get. The New York Numismatic Club membership felt that a book was necessary on fractional currency because there was no comprehensive list available at that time. And this is about 1913 when they did this. They announced in the numismatist that they were going to do this book. It would help not only classifying that, but it would also help serve as a guide for catalogers and stuff because there wasn't anything that existed. The book was going to have notes on it from Prosky's collections, along with Valentin's, Russell's, and he actually wrote a paper about 15 years before this on fractional. He was one of the first papers that was published on it. Lyman Lowe, Robert Earle, also Justin Brenner, although it's not noted in the records, but we know from, from research that Justin Brenner also had a bunch of fractional. He helped contribute his collection so they could look at what was there. And the book had the backing of Fred Boyd, and it was titled Fractional Currency of the United States. It was published in 1924. And here's the announcement for the publication that ran in the numismatist. Okay? The issue was going to be limited to 25 special leather bound copies at $25 each, and 225 of the red black cloths at five dollars each. Here's the leather one. 
25 were planned. There was a letter from Fred Boyd in 1928 or 29 that said he only um, issued 15 of them. Records we can find say there are only four that exist and one of them is not very good shape. This one was obviously an earlier one that was issued because that Julius Gutex uh, was issued to him. These books are kind of unique because they're hand numbered and signed by Dr. Valentine. The red books generally are not, although there are autographed copies of the red book, the red black one. But these were all hand signed. Here's the red and black one. 20, 225 were planned. My census shows that we've only we've been able to find 43. Of course, Max Mero, he a uh, constant salesman. He got the leftover unbound copies from Fred Boyd, put his own cover on them, and issued it as the second printing. And sold a few of them as well. But it has a different cover on it. Notice the name, Fractional Currency of the United States. Dirsch did a reprint. The name is now United States Fractional Currency. That was done in 81. This is one people see a lot of around because it's a white cover book. Dr. Valentine developed a number, numbering system for fractional currency and it was quickly adopted by the uh, brethren in that field. And it was used extensively until Robert Friedberg developed the Friedberg system in 1953, I believe. Because Friedberg covered all currency, not just fractional. Fra Valentin's numbering system shows up today periodically in the back of notes. In this note, you'll see in the upper left hand corner the number 31A. And if you pull out a Valentin book and go look, you'll get a description for this particular issue, for this particular variety. Okay? Most of the time, though, you see it with a number V, as in this case, V236. Okay? This note is out of the Berger collection because it's got his price code on the bottom. So it's out of the 58 sale of Berger stuff. What happened to Valentin's fractional collection? He had a very good collection. Nobody knows for sure. It's never showed up in any kind of public auction or anything of that nature. But there's speculation. We're fairly sure this is what happened. Boyd had sold his collection mid Later, latter part of the 1920s. That was about the time Valentin was dispersing all of his collections. So speculation is Boyd bought the Valentin collection and started over. I've been told there's a, there's a comment someplace in a, in a thing for, that says this, but we haven't been able to refine it again. Valentin had a lot of other collections. He had a complete collection of $1 gold by Mint. He had a large holding of foreign gold and silver, half cents, early dimes, Connecticut pieces, colonials, ancient gold. He had what was at the time purported to be the oldest coin, the one that was 750 years BC. This was all sold by Thomas Elder in a series of auctions in December 1927. What wasn't sold is in record of the fractional or it's half dimes. He had a very extensive collection of half dimes. It was exhibited once at ANS in 1914. There's records of that. He had identified 257 dye varieties just of the Liberty Seeded series of half dimes. His findings were published in the United States Half Dime book, ANS number 48, in 1931. And it's still used extensively um, 
and we use it to trace half dimes. This is what Stephen Crane has told me because this is the best example of pictures of his collection. I have to stumble in a newspaper article where they announced it in Englewood in the local paper. They had written this book and it had been published. There's a copy of the book, what it looks like. Some of you have probably seen it or may even have a copy of it. Why well, going backwards? Here we go. Dr. Ballantine. He died at home on January 24th of 32 of a stroke. His book was published in the fall of 31, so he had, was fortunate to complete his work. It was one of the various newspaper articles about his death in his obituary. He's interred in his parents' family plot in Brookside Cemetery in Inglewood. He's there with his dad, his mom, and his dad's second wife. And that's his marker. Now let's go look at what happened to Adabel. What happened to his wife? Following the death of her husband, she moved to LA. Her daughter, Mary Catherine, lived in Los Angeles. Okay. Adabel passed away in 1941, and she's interred at the Forest Lawn Cemetery out there in Glendale. There's Glen, is it, where's it at? It's in L.A. There's her, there's her uh, marker. Mary Catherine, oldest daughter. She moved to Hollywood in 1925 and worked in the script department of a major studio. We've not been able to figure out yet what studio she worked in. She became engaged to a gentleman by the name of Don McKay, who was a talent agent for a lot of big name stars in that era. But we find no record that the union ever took place. In 1944, she married Paul Ferrer, who was a well respected and highly decorated army officer. He was highly decorated for the Battle of the Argonne, Meuse Argonne Forest during World War I. Ironically, my grandfather got shot in the leg in the Battle of Meuse Forest in Meuse Argonne at night in World War I. I don't know if they ever crossed paths or not. He could have been the gentleman that sent my grandfather into battle. Who knows? Paul died in 1955. Marion passed away in December 1966. She also is interred at Forest Lawn Ceremony a sentiment cemetery, but there were no descendants from this family. So the family line stopped there. So I kind of ran into a dead end for chasing down old family photos. There's her marker. She's interred uh, in a vault. Okay, let's go the other way. Let's chase down the other daughter. Margaret followed her mom's path and she went into teaching. And through a mutual friend, she met and married a gentleman by the name of Frank Beatty. Together, they taught at Berkshire Schools, which is a private boarding school in Sheffield, Massachusetts. They spent their life teaching there. Peggy taught art, and Frank taught music. Margaret died July 24, 65. Frank died in 1997. And they're both interred together at the Sheffield Cemetery. No descendants. Shoot, now how do I find a family photo album? There's Margaret's stone. So now what? Am I done? No luck in finding a picture? Chasing the wind, that's kind of what I call it. So now we have to do other creative things. Now we go sideways. We got to chase down cousins. Cousins from other family branches. Okay, Caldwell family branch, the uh, Frank's family branch, because he had brother. 
And we got to chase down associates if we can find people they worked with. Religious associations. I've checked with the churches that we could find that they're related to. That they, they visited and were members of. The states. This is tricky. How do you find the executor of their estates? Especially if they were the end of the family line. Frank Beatty. Traced his immediate family and came up with nothing. Associates. I found a retired librarian that worked at Berkshire who remembered who Frank's caregiver was as an elderly man. And turns out his caregiver ended up also being the executor to his estate. Frank had left her a metal box with some things in it. But no photo albums. <coughs> I wonder what those things are. Let's look at their estate for a minute. There's the metal box. C.W. Valentine. This is the metal box from Daniel's father's hardware store in Inglewood, New Jersey. This was the change box. There was a book. And there's a copy of his book in there. He gave it to his daughter and J.M. Swanson, who was the gentleman that designed many of the medals, did this sketch of Dr. Valentine. And that was in the book. Another page. Oh, guess what? I found a picture. There he is sitting on a hammock with a couple friends. And his daughter was kind enough at the time to label who they were. Ha, huh, got a picture. Okay, let's keep looking. Let's go chase the other side down. Since Ada Bell had moved to L.A., started chasing the family lines for the Caldwells. Located a distant cousin, a Caldwell cousin, that remembered her when she was a little girl in California. Her mother and her were good friends. And they were both prolific readers. Her mother had gotten from her estate a bookcase full of books because they shared the love of reading. When this cousin's mother died, she ended up with this bookcase full of books. She said there was a photograph in there of Marion. And there were some other people, but she didn't know who they were. Oh, can, can you digitize them and send them to me so I can see what you got? So her daughter scanned it and he emailed them to me. There's a picture of Marion when she was a young lady. Oh, bingo, look what we found. Here's a picture of Marion, Margaret. And look, Adabel. So there's a family picture. All right, we went back to the other one. Bingo, found it. Here's a studio picture that they took in Inglewood. We surmise in the 1910 era. And look, Dr. Valentine. We finally found a picture. Any questions? What I have brought here today to show you in the display case is the metal box, the book, the leather bound book, and the metal objects that were also in that box, which were Dr. Valentine's own copies of his medal, one silver and one bronze. These were Dr. Valentine's. They got passed down to his daughter, to their estate. And I was able to acquire them from the estate. Yes, sir? It's about your research into this. Like, who took the pictures of the gravestones? I have friends. Uh, I had a friend in New Jersey go to the cemetery once I found it and asked him to take a picture. Same thing in California. What about uh, who did the research to find the marriage records? Me. It's a genealogy chase. Uh, you just have to could you do it all it took most that's why I didn't get the pictures because I I wasn't traveling 
I had friends in the area go take the pictures of the stones and things for me. I spent all my time chasing stuff on computers from various newspaper archives, Ancestry, the, the, uh, the um, uh, uh, site out of um, uh, LDS's site, uh, Family Search, I believe it's called, and that to try and find pieces to put it all together. So I could find out, and you know, well, there's another one of the grave sites or whatever that people put pictures of stones and stuff in, um, was able to locate all these pieces and put it together. And then had some, we didn't have a picture of Daniels, so I contacted somebody that lived not too far from the cemetery and asked them to go take a picture for me. The lady that handled um, the Beatty estate up in Massachusetts didn't live very close to Sheffield, but was going to go up there one day, and her and her husband, and she, I asked her if she would mind stopping by the cemetery and taking a picture, and she did that for me as well. So it's fascinating when you start doing family researches and stuff, a lot of people are willing to help you do this research. I chased cousins all over the U.S. before I finally ran into the cousin that was in California that had the bookcase. And as a thank you to her, I ended up buying a copy of Durst's book and sent it to her and said, this is why. This is Dr. Valentin's area and why. And she was pleased to get it. So now she understood because she didn't know who it was. She only knew the one, she called her her aunt. That's the only one that she knew. She did not, see, we don't know who this guy is. And bingo, I saw the picture and said, that's Dr. Valentine, that's her father. Da, 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 and gave her all that. So you give the information back to people too and they're pleased to have it. So that's all I have for you. Good. Did he have much uh, fractional currency in his pots or anything? Oh, no, there was not. Uh, we think the fractional currency went to Fred Boyd. Okay. We think Fred bought it. Um, we don't know. Nobody knows whatever happened to the half dime collection. Stephen Crane can find a couple pieces that match out of the plates in the original book. But other than that, there's no record of whatever may have happened to his half dime collection. And I've asked. Every time I find a connection, I ask. You think I really little silver dimes? But no such luck. So that's part of doing research on somebody. Uh, you, you dive into all this history and you learn a lot about the individual and what they're like and what they did and more than just their, their numismatic stuff. And it's pretty fascinating. I found my picture. Impressive. It was about three years worth of work. Well, Derek, just uh, wanted to thank you very much oh. on behalf of the ANA and our education department for uh, sharing your time and knowledge with us today. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jerry. You bet.